Morning, brethren. Today is a, not very shiny, sunny, but it's wet. It's the rain is falling and God is good. He waters the ground that we may have an abundance of his goodness. And for these mercies, we are grateful. We want to welcome again all of you to our service this morning. We want to kneel for a word of prayer and invite God's presence and his guidance as we examine his word. So at this time, let us all bow on our knees for a word of prayer. Thanks. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your goodness and your love and for the fact, Lord, that as we approach your throne of grace, we can be assured that you will hear us because of the love that you have manifested towards us and given all of heaven that we may be able to be redeemed, to be sanctified, and to be glorified, that we may have the presence of your spirit with us. As we open your word, we ask that each mind may, be, may hear the voice of God speaking to their hearts individually, that we will examine our hearts and look to Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith, trusting in him to deliver us, to sanctify us, and to cause us to walk in heavenly places in Christ. Guide and direct us to this end, Thank you for the showers, rains. Thank you for the goodness and mercy is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. I think you'll be, you have been given a handout, but we, we were told to read last week that John chapter 1, 15, 16, and John chapter 15, 16, and 17 are important chapters to read on a daily basis. I was reading the chapters, and I came across John chapter 16, verses 25 to 28, and if you could open your Bibles with me to John chapter 16, verses 25 to 28, and it says this, it says, these things have I spoken unto you, Jesus speaking, in Proverbs, speaking to the disciples, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. And that day ye shall ask in my and, and uh, at that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. You know when, when you when you read this text, uh, it's a very interesting text because. He is saying, the word ask really mean, the really word ask in, the, in Greek means to beg or to petition. And Jesus is saying that he will not have to beg or beseech the Father to give you what you ask for because the Father loves you. And Christ, in, in 1 St. Corinthians 5 9, he says that Christ that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And because, and you have to understand that the Father, there's a, there's a counsel of peace between the Father and the Son. Meaning that the mind of the Son towards us is the mind of the Father towards us. So that when we pray to God, we are assured that the Father himself will answer our prayers and that his mind towards us is one of love. And, 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 and we are not to look at the Father as if he is some being that Christ has to beg to give us the things that are good for us. He, his love for us is exercised in his willingness to sacrifice all of heaven for our good. And that is the Father and the God that we serve. He's merciful, he is kind, he is tender. He is forgiving. He's loving. And that is the God that we serve. Turn to the handout. And remember, we are looking at the blood note of sin. And we are looking at our minds and our thoughts and our hearts being in tune with the mind and the thoughts of God. We open with this, with this scripture which says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one, one to another. The more closely we resemble our Savior in character, 
the greater will be our love towards those for whom he died. Christians who manifest a spirit of unselfish love for one another are being a testimony for Christ, which unbelievers can neither gainsay nor resist. It is impossible to estimate the power of such an example. Nothing will so successfully defeat the devices of Satan and his emissaries. Nothing will so build up the Redeemer's kingdom as will the love, as will the love of Christ manifested by the members of the church. Peace and prosperity can be enjoyed only as meekness and love are in active exercise. In his first epistle to the Romans, the Apostle Paul sets forth the importance of that love which shall be cherished by the followers of Christ. He says, though I speak, and this is 1 Corinthians 13, with the tongues of men and of angels, I'm half not love. I am become as sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. No matter how high his profession, he is whose heart is not imbued with the love for God and for his fellow men is not a disciple of Christ. Though he should possess great faith and even have power to work miracles, yet without love, his faith would be worthless. He might display great liberality, but should he from some other motive than genuine love bestow all his goods to feed the poor, the art would not commend him to the favor of God. In his zeal, he might even meet a martyr's death. Yet, if destitute of the gold of love, he would be regarded by God as a deluded enthusiast or an ambitious hypocrite. The apostle perceived to specify the fruits of love. Love, charity, suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. The divine love ruling in the heart exterminates pride and selfishness. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. The purest joy springs from the, depth, from the deepest humiliation. The strongest and noblest characters rest upon the foundation of patience and love and trusting submission to the will of God. Charity doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, and is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. The heart in which love rules will not be filled with passion or revenge. By, inquiries, by injuries which pride and self-love will deem unbearable. Listen to this carefully and I underlined it and put it in black because I found it very, very inspiring to me. Love is unsuspecting. Ever placing the most favorable construction upon the motives and acts of others. You know, one of the greatest disturbances that is found in families, in families and in the church, is this suspicion of brethren. You know, sometimes your wife can come and say something to you, all for your good, but you interpret that what she's saying makes you feel less than a man. I believe the men can understand what I'm talking about. And we respond not favorably, but can, we can respond sometimes very hurtful to our spouses. And this is what the scripture is talking about. Love is unsuspecting and ever places the most favorable construction upon the motives and acts of others. Now that to me is, should touch each and every one of our minds. Love will never needlessly expose the flock faults of others. You hear that? It does not listen eagerly to unfavorable reports, 
but rather seeks to bring to mind some good qualities of the one defamed. So in other words, love, if you understand what it is, or what is being here presented as to what the nature of love is all about, it doesn't listen to gossip. It doesn't listen to what evil people have to say about it. it's that a person. It always tries to think the best of the other person and not the worst. That is what love is all about. And by the way, this love is what God has manifested towards us. God has not looked upon our faults or condemned us according to our behavior. As a matter of fact, he does not hold our faults against us. He overlooks them and tells us of how much he loves us and how much he has died to save us. And with that revelation of his love, we are able to be delivered from the evil of our ways. Now we have, it says, on oh, the next page, love rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. He whose heart is imbued with love is filled with sorrow at the errors and weaknesses of others. But when truth triumphs, when the cloud that darkened the fair frame of another is removed, or when sins are confessed and wrongs corrected, he rejoices. This is another piece of lovely analysis here that is given. Bear all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Listen to this. Love not only bears with others' faults, but cheerfully submits to whatever suffering or inconvenience such forbearance makes necessary. You understand that? You understand that? Love not only bears with a person's faults, but the word is cheerfully, not complainingly, but cheerfully submits to whatever, other, whatever suffering or inconvenience such forbearance makes necessary. In other words, when a person is at fault, you not only bear with their fault, but if you have to suffer an inconvenience because of that person's fault, you are to do it cheerfully. That is what the scripture says when it says that it beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. You see, love never fails. This love never faileth. It can never lose its value. It is an attribute of heaven. As a precious treasure, it will be carried by its possessors to the portals of the city of God. So this love that we are speaking about, that we are to have one towards another. When a person has a fault, first of all, you don't seek to expose the fault. Neither do you hold the fault of the person against them. And if the fault causes you a little inconvenience, you, are, you, 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 you allow yourself to be... To, 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 to be... The word is that I'm looking for that you would allow whatever the inconvenience is and that you will be cheerful in doing for that person what, you, what the person will require you to do. Now, these things in the family, that is why Satan attacks the family structure. Because in our families, you know, when, when you begin to rub... When you talk about a husband and wife, there are words spoken sometimes that are not nice. Agree? It shouldn't be spoken. The man who speaks them is at fault. But the reaction of the other person to the words spoken is what we're here talking about. Right? So if you get up in the morning and your husband is sitting down and you feel like he's too lazy and he won't get up and do nothing for himself, as usual. You know men are sometimes. Not all men are like this. And I'm not hitting men deliberately. And you as a wife have to do these things. My problem is you get breakfast and so on. Or you might have to cook. And you might be slaving over the stove for a long time. Hot and sweaty. And your husband is having a fault. You know your fault is? Fellas like to sit down. And don't really come and assist. You are to be cheerful. You are to do it cheerfully. You are to bear all things. I am not saying that you are not to tell your husband at the correct time that what he's doing is not right. 
But I'm saying that you are not to do it and complain and fret and quarrel. That's what the scripture is saying. You are to bear all things, regardless of the circumstance and the inconvenience. You are to do it cheerfully. That is God's requirement on the part of the individual who is undergoing the requirement to sacrifice for the good of others. Of course, the person who's, who's causing the person to go through that experience is wrong, and they should know better. But the important thing that God... Do we understand how much God has borne for us and suffered for us? You must not look at the cross as the only place that God has suffered for you, you know. Every day in your disobedience, God suffers for you. God feels the pain of the hurt that you experience in your life because of disobedience. God suffers for each individual person. The cross, says the testimony, is but a revelation to our dull senses of the type of suffering that God has endured for us sinful human beings since the entrance of sin. So the sufferings of the cross is but a revelation to what God has been experiencing on our behalf because of all the things that we have done in disobedience to him. So if you have to suffer a little inconvenience for your brother or sister, understand that you are manifesting the spirit and the character of God. Now, the fruit of the spirit is, joy, is love, joy, peace, peace. Listen to this carefully. Discord and strife are the work of Satan and the fruit of sin. Anytime in the family or in the church there is discord and strife, understand that it is the work and the fruit of the enemy of our souls. Don't care if both sides are claiming that they're standing upon the word of God. In regard, you know, there are men. You know, there are men in the church, when it comes to discord, everybody stands upon the word of God and nobody's agreeing with one another, you know. Now, I don't understand how you can stand upon the word of God, which says that you are to be of one mind and still don't agree with your brother. I don't know which word that is that you're standing on. You understand where you're coming from? You cannot stand upon the word of God and there's division and strife among the church of God. It is impossible to do that. Listen very carefully. If we would as people enjoy peace and love, we must put away our sins, we must come into harmony with God, and we shall be in harmony with one another. So there's no greater evidence that there's no harmony with God than by strife and division in the church of God. I want us, when I'm saying amen, but I want you to understand there is no greater evidence that you are not in harmony with God, but that you have strife and division in the church or in the family. I want you all to understand that. Have, 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 have I learned to suffer long? Listen to what she says. Discord and strife are the work of Satan and the fruit of sin. If we would as people enjoy peace and love, we must put away our sins. We must come into harmony with God. And we shall be in harmony with one another. Let each ask himself, do I possess the heavenly attribute? Do I possess the grace of love? Have I learned to suffer long and be kind? Talents, learning, eloquence without this heavenly attribute will be as meaningless as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Alas, that this question that this precious treasure is so lightly valued and so little sought by many who profess the faith. Do I possess the grace of love? That is the question. Do I possess the grace of love? Paul writes to the Colossians, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy and kindness, humbleness of mind, Meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. 
and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. And whatsoever you do in the word or in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. The fact that we are under so great obligation to Christ places, places us under the most sacred obligation to whom he died to redeem. We are to manifest toward them the same sympathy, the same tender compassion and unselfish love which Christ has manifested towards us. Selfish ambition, desire for supremacy will die when Christ takes possession of the affections. I'm not going to go on. It's now 25 past, so we have to stop at, at, um, in the next five minutes. Brethren, the grace of love is needed by every member of the church. The grace of love brings, about, brings within the church this principle, what, what we like to talk about, called primitive godliness. When love is the, act, is the function of our behavior. When we understand that, when we have love for our brethren, we do not criticize, suspect, or judge their actions and make a conclusion on their actions even without approaching the brother to discuss and understand what he truly means. Love, love does not seek to expose the faults of others. In our families, we have to learn to understand and exhibit this love that God has manifested towards us. We are to be forgiven even as God has forgiven us. Later down the, down the passage, we will read probably next week, it talks about the fact that there are people who says the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, decide that they are not going to forgive a brother or sister, and after that kneel down in prayer and ask God to forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors, not understanding that there's a condition upon which God forgives and we receive the total forgiveness of God. It has to do with our forgiveness of each other, of our forgiving each other. So if I have wronged my wife, and she will tell you that the Lord have to give her patience with me. I don't know about the other ways, but my wife has to have a lot of patience. She must forgive me for the deeds that I have done. She must also tell me of the wrong that I have done. And I must also be submissive when she's right to the things that she said to me so that there may be harmony. The love of Christ brings harmony in the family and it brings harmony in the church. There can be no awareness in the church of God. There can be no man feeling that his opinion is more right than another man. And because the other man's opinion is having a sway, you get vexed and you're not attending the meeting, nor you aren't coming, because the one opinion is being held and yours isn't getting attention. All of those types of things is calling, is called seeking to be first. You understand that? And where the love of Christ is, self is dead. Look at what Jesus Christ did for humanity. He left all heaven among the glories and honors of, 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 the, of, the, of the heavenly host and came down to a people who he created who had no respect for him whatsoever. And he was cheerful. He was cheerful in the exercise of his duty towards those he came to save who, had, who, who neglected him who taught all types of evil against him. As a matter of fact, he said that they said that John the Baptist was a madman because he lived in the desert. And because I come and sit down with sinners, I am a rambibber. So you understand the kind of attack upon the character of Christ that was levied by those whom he came to save. And all of this Christ endured. And if you have to endure a little vexing situation, and put yourself, and Jesus put himself completely out of the way 
so that he will, by his love manifested, will be able to win those whom he have come to save to an understanding of who God is. Because we have to understand that when you see Jesus behaving, it is God that is behaving. It is the Father in heaven that is exercising that on that forgiving love to you and to me. And he exercises it in such a way that it becomes clear that he loves us and that he's willing to sacrifice and that he was willing to sacrifice all heaven for us. Understand that the Father allowed Christ to come to die and he didn't only allow him, but he was in him when he was suffering on the cross of Calvary for your sins. So God was in Christ redeeming you to himself. So it wasn't, so the, the council of peace, the fact that they both had one mind towards us is enough for us to understand the love that God has manifested towards us and the type of love that God expects us to manifest one towards another. There's a song named 569 that I want us to sing. 569. I don't have the book with me. What's your name? Is Pass me not. Listen to the word. Pass me not, O oh, gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. So the organist will come and play for me, please. While on others they are calling, do not pass me by. Let me at thy throne of mercy find the sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition, help my own belief. Trusting only in thy merit. Would I seek thy face, heal my wound, broke, wounded, broken spirit, save me by thy grace. Uh, Sabbath school? Or let's sing. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Let me at thy throne of mercy. Let me at thy throne of mercy find the sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition, help my own belief. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by trusting only in thy merit. Trusting only in thy merit, would I seek thy face? Heal my wounded, broken spirit. Heal my wounded, broken spirit. Save me by thy grace. Save me by thy grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not 
pass me by Thou the spring of all my comfort Thou the spring of all my comfort More than life for me Whom have I on earth beside thee? Whom in him but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we want to thank you very much that you have promised not to pass us by. Well, Father, you've promised that you'll be with us even on to the end of the world. You've got promised, you have given us the forgiveness. You have given us of your righteousness. You have given us of your merits. And gracious Father, we can approach your throne of grace because you are kindly disposed towards us and you love us, love us with an everlasting love. Father, teach us and grant us the grace of love that we may exercise this loving kindness, this merciful greatness towards each other that we may esteem each other better than ourselves, that we will not condemn each other or seek to raise the faults of others before our eyes, but that, O oh Father, that we will, we will look kindly upon each member and each of our brethren in this church, not by acts of condemnation, but by love bind us together, that we may be one even as you, O Father, and the Son are one, that we may be one in you and with each other, that we may receive the glorious outpouring of the latter rain power to finish the work that you have called us to do in this earth. Guide us towards this end. Give us endless opportunity, Lord, to remember these words and to put in practice the words spoken to our minds, words of love and kindness, that as we behold the kindness and the grace of Christ, that we may be kindly disposed one towards another. These mercies we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you very much. We now divide for our classes.